So here we have 1.2 PPC and opportunity cost. What we're going to be looking at today, first and foremost, is being able to just define the, the term opportunity cost. We're going to draw a production possibilities curve, our PPC, and we're also going to then identify some of those points that are on our production possibilities curve. We're going to be able to solve for opportunity cost within a given scenario, whether it's through using a graph or using a table. And then finally, we're going to differentiate between something known as constant opportunity cost and increasing opportunity cost. So first, let's go ahead and recap from last time. Just what is economics? Well, we said economics is the study of decision making, right? We have to make decisions. But why do we have to make decisions? Well, this problem of scarcity. Remember, we have an unlimited amount of things that we might want or need. However, we have a limited amount of resources in order to, to, you know, to make the goods and services to satisfy those wants and needs. So it's this issue of scarcity when it comes down to it. And scarcity is this problem that all societies are going to face. Every single society deals with this problem of scarcity. And that's why we learn and study about economics. Now, it isn't only true at like a societal level, like at an entire economy. It's also true in our daily lives. Like we see this all the time. And so we're going to start off looking at this economic model of a production possibilities curve. But before we get there, I want to spend a second looking at an example known as a budget line, which will give us a lot of those same ideas that we see within a production possibilities curve. So making decisions. Let's say that you have $240. You're going to go back to school shopping and you're going to buy either shoes or you're going to buy shirts. Let's say every shirt that you want is going to cost you $30. Every pair of shoes cost you 60. And so if we were to set up a table with shirts and shoes, Let's talk about some of those different options you have in terms of what you might buy throughout the day. Well, if you wanted to just buy shirts, you have $240. Each shirt costs you $30. How many shirts could you buy? Well, you could buy eight shirts. But the problem is if you buy eight shirts and you're only buying shirts, you're not going to be able to buy any shoes. So that's one option. Well, what if we were only to buy shoes? You know, again, you have $240, $60 a pair of shoes. You could buy four pairs of shoes but then you're not going to be able to buy any shirts because you've used up all your money. Now, are those our only two options that we have? No, of course not. We have other options we can mix and match in between. Maybe we want six shirts and we can buy one pair of shoes. We use all of our money. Maybe we want four shirts and two pairs of shoes or two shirts and three pairs of shoes. We have different options, right? We have different choices we can make. We have decisions that we have to make, how we want to use our money. But also one thing that we're going to do with this table is we're going to plot out those points. So here on our y-axis, we're going to put shirts. And then on our x-axis, we're going to put our shoes. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take these points and we're going to plot them out. So we have point A up there, B, C, D, and E. And what all of these different points represent are different possibilities at which we could purchase or we could use our $240. And every single one of those points represents a point where we are using all $240 of our money. But what we're going to end up doing is just connecting those dots and making a line out of this. And this line is going to represent any use of our $240 where we are using all and exactly $240. Now, every single point along that line, like we said, is using all of our money in some way, whether it's only on shirts, only on shoes, or some sort of mix of the both. What if I got up to the cash register, though, and I had six shirts in hand and three pairs of shoes? Am I going to be able to make that purchase? Well, no, I don't have enough money. Any of those points that are outside are unattainable because we don't have enough money. If I wanted to buy six shirts and three pairs of shoes, I'd need $360 and I don't have that much. I only have 240. Any of those points outside are unattainable. We can't reach it because our resource in this case of money is, is scarce. We don't have enough of it. What if I get up to the cash register though and I only have two shirts in hand and one pair of shoes? Well, in this case, we would say, yeah, that's definitely achievable. It's attainable, but it's inefficient. You know, we set out with this goal to go spend this money on back to school clothes and we didn't. We were inefficient with our use of money. And so therefore we'd say all those points inside are attainable, but they're inefficient and it's an inefficient use of our money. So within this, I also want to point out another thing. Um, let's say we decide to buy six shirts and one pair of shoes. So we're operating right there at point B, that red point right there. And let's say as you're walking out, you're walking out of the store and you see a pair of shoes that just really catches your eye. And you're like, man, I really have to pair that, get that pair of shoes. So what do you have to do? Well, you have $240 and only $240. Right now in your hands, you have $60 worth of shoes and you have $180 worth of shirts. You got to make some choices, right? 
So what are we going to do? Well, if you want to add that one pair of shoes, you want to buy that second pair of shoes, you're going to have to put something back. You're going to have to put something back on the shelves. And in this case, you'd have to put back two of those shirts in order to make sure that you had enough money. And we would see our movement from point B down to point C. Because we're still using all $240, we're just moving from one point to another, which is representing us using our money in a different way, right? And so this brings us to this idea of trade-offs and opportunity cost. If we want to buy another pair of shoes, we must give something up, right? And so in this case, if we wanted to buy that pair of shoes, we're going to have to give up buying two of those shirts. We call this a trade-off, right? Just like in a trade, you must give something up in order to get something else. That's what trading is. Well, trade-off is just in that scenario where we have to give something up in order to obtain something else. Now, trade-offs are creating something we call opportunity costs. Opportunity cost is just like that term says. It's where the cost is an opportunity, right? What you have to give up is some opportunity. In this case, we gave up the opportunity to buy those two shirts. An opportunity cost is the value of your next best option or your next best alternative. It's just whatever you have to give up. In this case, our best alternative besides buying that second pair of shoes was buying those two shirts. Therefore, our opportunity cost was two shirts. And this brings us to another principle we see within economics known as Tinstoffel, which stands for there's no such thing as a free lunch. Now, some of you might say, hey, I've gone and, and I went out to eat and I didn't have to pay for it. It was free. Well, let's think about that in a couple ways. First and foremost, even if something's free for you, meaning if it doesn't cost you any physical money, it's actually probably not free. Somebody has to pay for that meal, whether it's a friend or a parent or someone, somebody's paying for it. But at the same time, even if you're not paying for it, because of these opportunity costs and these trade-offs, sometimes the cost of having that free lunch doesn't come as money, but it comes in terms of what you have to give up. Like by you going and you going and you having that lunch, you're giving up the opportunity to be doing something else. So while there might not be explicit like money costs, there's always going to be an opportunity cost. There's always going to be something that we have to give up. You know, you go to school. What's the opportunity cost of being at school? What did you have to give up to go to school? Well, maybe you had to give up the opportunity to work, right? That would be your opportunity cost. So let's look at what this would look like in terms of our actual model, the production possibilities curve. Now, again, the production possibilities curve, you might already be able to see from the name of it, is it shows us our different possible points of production, right? Easy name. So let's say we're going to produce either jeans or we're going to produce shorts. So here are a bunch of different points that we would say are different options. If we put all of our focus just toward the production of jeans, we could produce 10 pairs of jeans, but then we wouldn't be able to produce any shorts. In the same way, if we put all of our focus on producing shorts, we could make 15 pairs of shorts, but no jeans. Again, we have different options in between along the way. So let's go ahead and plot those points out. We'll have jeans be our y-axis along there, and then we'll have our shorts be the x-axis down there. And if we start plotting out these points, you see you have point A there, B, C, D, E, and F. And again, these points are representing those coordinates, and these coordinates are representing different possible production points for us. That means that this line, when we connect those dots, is our production possibilities curve. It's this line that's going to show us all the different production points that we might be able to produce at. So let's say this is, in a given day, what I am able to produce or what I am able to make in my little shop, right? I could produce maybe up here at point A. I could make 10 pairs of jeans, but then I wouldn't be able to make any shorts. Maybe I split my time and I make six pairs of jeans and six pairs of shorts. Maybe I'm down here only making shorts. No matter what, at any of those points, I'm using all my resources and I'm being fully efficient with my resources along the way. I'm using all those resources to the absolute best of my ability. Now, there's a couple rules we want to talk about when it does come to the production possibilities curve. This first rule I want us to know is that our resources are fixed both in quality and in quantity, meaning the amount of those resources we have or how good those resources are, right? We only have so many sewing machines. We only have so much material. We only have so many workers. Whatever it might be, those resources are fixed. Also, we're going to say anytime we're along that PPC, that production possibilities curve, our resources, we're going to assume, are being used efficiently. And then finally, anytime we're, we, we are producing, our resources are being only used to produce one of two goods. And really what this means is that, yeah, we could be producing other things. We could be using this material to make jean jackets. However, we're going to say we're just going to be producing one of two goods. 
Now, the reason we're going to play by these rules is because in economics, what these models attempt to do is take a big idea and simplify it for us. So we're going to try to keep things as simple as possible as we go throughout this. So looking back at our production possibilities curve, let's talk about what some of these different areas or points on the curve represent. First and foremost, we have any point along that curve. Well, we already said our points such as A, B, C, D, E, and F, and then anything else in between represents us being fully efficient. At any of these points along here, what that means is that I am using all my resources, my capital, my land, my labor. I'm using all of those to the best of my ability. And that's a good thing. Like we want to be as efficient as we can with our resources. But let's say I walk into my shop one day and I have the goal that day of making eight pairs of jeans and nine pairs of shorts. Am I going to do that? I'm not going to be able to because that's outside the curve and I don't have the resources to do that. Any point outside of that curve is impossible because our resources are too scarce. We can't produce at those points because we don't have enough resources to do so. The production possibilities curve already represents us being fully efficient, so we're not going to be able to go past that. Sometimes the production possibilities curve is also referred to as the production possibilities frontier because it kind of represents that leading edge, like a leading edge we can't go past or we can't achieve on our own. All right, let's say I get to the end of the day and I find out I've only made four pairs of jeans and three shorts. What would we say about my day? Well, we'd say I was pretty inefficient with my day. Yeah, those points are achievable, like we're able to make that kind of quantity. However, I'm not using all my resources to the best of my ability. Maybe I spent some of the day kind of just killing time, or maybe I wasn't working as efficiently as possible. So anywhere inside the curve, we say, yeah, that's achievable, it's possible, but it's inefficient, and we don't want to be inefficient. Again, sometimes we see that inefficiency with our resources has a certain name. For example, like if we're inefficient with our labor, we sometimes call that unemployment. If you think about the economy as a whole, if we have workers or labor that's available but it's not being used, that means we're being inefficient. Because hey, we've got labor that is there and ready to be used, but it's just sitting idle. It's not being used. Therefore, we're being inefficient. And so we'll see some of these inefficiencies anytime that we are sitting inside of that curve. I want to bring up back to this idea of opportunity cost, whenever we have to give something up to get something else. So if I was to say to you, what's our opportunity cost for producing six more pairs of shorts? Well, here's what that means. Let's say I'm operating here at point B, right? And at point B, I'm producing three pairs of shorts and eight pairs of jeans. But all of a sudden I think, hey, you know what? People want more shorts. I need to make more shorts. So I want to start producing six more pairs of shorts a day. So I'd have to jump from three pairs of shorts up to nine pairs of shorts. But in order to do that, I'm not gonna be able to do that for free, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. I can't just start making more shorts without having to give up something else. In order to do that, I would have to drop my gene production from eight down to four. And in dropping my gene production from eight down to four, we would say my opportunity cost or what I have to give up to gain those six more pairs of shorts is four pairs of jeans, right? Because in order to start making more shorts, I'm gonna have to use my time and my resources and all those things. I'm gonna have to start using them on shorts instead of jeans. And so I'm gonna have to stop some of my production of jeans. In fact, I'm gonna have to stop producing four pairs of jeans in order to do that. That's our opportunity cost. It's what we have to give up in order to get something else. Well, how about this case? What's the opportunity cost of your first six pairs of jeans? So first six pairs, if we look at the way that those words are used, first six assumes that we're starting at zero, right? Since these next pairs of jeans we're making are our first ones. Let's say we go from zero up to six, right? By going from zero up to six or point F to point C, we are adding genes. But again, in order to add those genes, we have to give something else up. Well, what are we gonna give up? Well, we have to drop our short production from 15 down to six. 15 minus six leaves us with nine pairs of shorts that we had to give up. So our opportunity cost to produce those first, first six pairs of genes is nine pairs of shorts. And then finally, we say, what is your opportunity cost of producing your fourth pair of jeans? Now, fourth is very specific because what fourth is saying is we're just adding one more. We're going from our third up to our fourth. But this gets a little tricky because if you notice here, we don't have a three onto four pairs of jeans. So how do we figure this out? Well, what we'd have to do first is we would have to set these equal to each other in production, right? Here's what that means. Let's say we wanted to... Um, only focus on genes. Well, if we put all of our resources toward genes, we could produce 10 pairs of genes. If we put all of our focus toward producing shorts, we could produce 15 shorts. 
all right? So that means 10 pairs of jeans is equal to 15 pairs of shorts in production, right? So if 10 pairs of jeans is equal to 15 pairs of shorts, like if I wanted to produce 10 more pairs of jeans, I would have to give up 15 pairs of shorts, right? I'd have to go from one side all the way to the other. Well, then how much is it just for one pair of jeans? Well, how would we simplify 10 pairs of jeans down to just one? Well, we just divide it out by five. And since we divide 10, or sorry, my bad, divide, I got ahead of myself. We have to divide it out by 10, right? 10 divided by 10 is equal to one, but then 15 divided by 10 gets us down to 1.5, 1.5 pairs of shorts. Now, another little cheat way to do that is you could just look here and say, okay, well, I know three falls right here in between two and four. Well, what falls right here in between nine and 12? Well, it's 10 and a half. So if we were to jump from three right here in the middle up to four, we would drop from 10 and a half down to nine. So going from 10 and a half down to nine, that's giving up one and a half pairs of shorts. We're gonna do more practice with that through, over time and throughout class, so don't get too worried about it right now. Kind of one last point I wanna talk about when it comes to efficiency is this. We can produce at any of these points along our line and any of them are productive, but does it mean it's the best? Not necessarily. So let's kind of see what's going on here. Let's take Apple for example. Two big products that Apple makes are iPhones and MacBooks. Now, if Apple was to put all their focus just on producing iPhones this year, let's say they could produce 400 million iPhones. Or if they put all their focus on producing MacBooks, they could make 40 million of, the, or 40 million of those. If we connected those points, we'd say this is their production possibilities curve. They could produce anything along that line. Now, any of those points are considered to be productive. or we say is productive efficiency. All of our resources are being fully employed. We're using all our resources to the best of our ability. And we said being efficient is a good thing. But does that mean it's right? Like, is that what is best for our company? You know, I think Apple could say that, you know, producing 400 million iPhones and no MacBooks probably isn't going to make the people too happy. In the same way, if they only made MacBooks, there'd be tons of people wanting phones and a ton of extra laptops just sitting around. So what do we do? Well, there's some point along our production possibilities curve that represents the most efficient production point. And we call that point the point of allocative efficiency. This point of allocative efficiency is a single point that represents the preference of the customers. For example, last year, Apple actually did produce 216 million iPhones and 19 million MacBooks. Well, why those numbers? Because that represented what the customers wanted, right? They produced the number of iPhones that people wanted and the number of MacBooks that people wanted, and they were sitting along their production possibilities curve where they were using their resources efficiently. So any point is productively efficient. However, there's only a single point that represents those preferences of the customers, that one point that is the most allocatively efficient point where we're using our resources to the best of our ability while we are being productively efficient, right? It's the best way to distribute our resources between either iPhones or MacBooks. Now, as you've noticed, all of our production possibilities curves up to this point have been linear. They've been straight lines. Now, there's a specific reason for that. We actually refer to this as a constant opportunity cost. What a constant opportunity cost means is that our opportunity cost is gonna remain the same per unit at all times. Again, and we can see this in our graph because the slope stays the same. An easy way to kind of visualize this is let's look at this rise over run, you know? Let's take a look at these stair steps from point to point. Anytime we wanna add six apples to our production, or six oranges to our production, we have to give up four apples. And if you see our stair steps say the same, add six oranges, down four apples, add six oranges, down four apples, add six oranges, down four apples, every single time. And so our opportunity cost, whenever we have to give up or add, let's say six oranges, we have to give up four apples every single time, add six oranges, give up four apples, add six oranges, give up four apples. Every single time, our opportunity cost is gonna remain the same. And that's because our production possibilities curve is a straight line. But why is it a straight line? Well, it's because the resources used to produce those two goods are fairly adaptable. What we mean is like the resources you need to grow either apples or oranges or harvest apples and oranges are very, very similar. And therefore, if we shift some of our resources from one production to the other, it's not going to cause a lot of fuss. You know, if we're going to start, you know, making more oranges than apples, we need this, you know, same kind of land, like good quality land. We need the same kind of resources in terms of planting and picking. And so all of those things we see, our resources are pretty adaptable because they essentially use the same resources. And so moving resources around isn't gonna be all that big of a deal. 
Now on the other side, we see something known as increasing opportunity cost. If you notice here, our production possibilities curve is bowed out a little bit or curved out a little bit. And there's a very specific reason for that. Let's say we're producing butter and chairs. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think butter and chairs use that similar of resources, and they don't. And because of that, we end up seeing that the opportunity cost is actually increasing per unit that we produce. And so um, if you guys see, if we were to draw a tangent line at each one of these points, our tangent line or our slope is gonna get steeper and steeper along the way. And again, there's a very specific reason for that. Let's take a look at these stair steps. Every single time, let's say if we're starting up here at point A, that we wanna add one chair, it's going to cost us some butter. So when we add that first chair, we're gonna to have to give up seven tubs of butter, right? So our opportunity cost for that first chair is seven tubs of butter. But when we add this next chair, our opportunity cost now becomes 13 tubs of butter. Our opportunity cost is increased. And when we add another chair, our opportunity cost goes up even more. Now it's 20 tubs, and then it's 27, and then 33. So every single time our opportunity cost is increasing, it's going up. And that's why our production possibilities curve is or production possibilities curve is curved or bowed out. And it's because the resources to produce those, they're not very adaptable to one another. Like it's, you know, shifting production from of you know our resources productively from butter to chairs, it's going to be pretty tough to do. Like the resources aren't very adaptable to one another. And so we end up seeing because they use very different resources, it's hard to transfer them from one to the other. And every single time we want to produce more chairs, we're going to have to give up better and better resources that were, were better suited for butter than chairs. And therefore, every time we want to add another chair, and as we give up better and better resources toward the production of chairs, it's going to cost us more butter. And so again, that's why we have an increasing opportunity cost.